I'm Larry Weeks, and this is Bounce. The average smartphone user checks their phone 150 times a day. Time on the screen is not necessarily bad. What is bad is unintentional, non-thoughtful use of technology. Technology is not a replacement for real conversation. It's another avenue to add to relationship building. There's this pain point about technology and happiness and technology specifically draining happiness because people feel overwhelmed. They are just, they're tired. They don't know what to do with all this information. They have so many gadgets flooding over their nightstands that they don't know what to do with it and how to evaluate what's actually good for them. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bounce. There are UX designers at Apple, Facebook, Google, throw in any tech company of any significance who study how to get and keep people's attention. They need engagement. Uh, Today, those companies will direct the attention of a billion people. They will direct your attention. When you use your phone or see a notification, it then hijacks your thoughts. You are then pulled into something that takes up time that you did not schedule. My question to you is, um, oh, hold on. I am doing a podcast. Not available. Give me a few minutes. Okay. 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 Where was I? I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, those companies will direct the attention of a billion people. They will direct your attention. So my question is, not only what is that doing to your productivity, but more importantly, what is that doing to your happiness? As a society, we've bought into the idea that smart tech can do smart things, but using smart tech smartly is a whole other issue. And that is what we're going to talk about today on the podcast. Enter Amy Blankson, my guest on this episode. Amy has become the world's leading expert on the connection between happiness and technology. Her new book, The Future of Happiness, was just released at the time that I talked with Amy, and it examines how we can leverage technology and all the current advances in tech to increase our productivity and happiness. Amy recently gave a TEDx talk on the topic, and she is considered to be one of the world's leading experts on the connection between positive psychology and technology. She's a sought-after speaker and consultant. Amy received her BA from Harvard and MBA from the Yale School of Management. She was also a feature professor in Oprah's Happiness Course. On this podcast, Amy does a great job in helping me answer questions like, would we be happier without tech? How do we find happiness in spite of all this distraction? How can we teach our kids appropriate tech boundaries and can happiness keep pace with innovation? We need technology in our lives and it benefits us greatly, but uh, managing it is a whole other thing. So let's talk to Amy. Amy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Larry. I'm so glad to be here. So happy to have you here. All right. How many times do we check our phones? You've done some studies, right? I have. You would not believe it. The average smartphone user checks their phone 150 times a day. And if that doesn't sound crazy to you, what's most amazing and astounding to me is that if you assume optimistically it takes about one minute to check your phone each time, that's the equivalent of spending two and a half hours every day checking your phone or the equivalent of 38 days a year. So 17 hours a week? Seventeen. Exactly. Hours. So, exactly. W- 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 when the study did it, checking the phone, was that mean just opening it? The idea is how many times you unlock and lock your oh, phone. Got it. So, you pick up your phone, you check it, you put it back down, and you pick it back up. That's time number two. So, how many times are you impulsively picking up your phone throughout the day? And you know, I studied it for myself. I actually there's an app I love called Realized. It's, it's like R E A. L I Z D and it runs in the background of your phone to tell you how many times you really do pick up your phone because I thought, you know, I'm not the average smartphone user. Surely I'm not up there. In fact, I wasn't. I only pick up my phone on average about 50 times a day, which is still bad. But <laughs> but what was interesting to me was that on an average week, I was on my phone four to five hours a day. Four to five hours a day. And some of that's work. 
but a lot of it's not. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, if you're just, if it was just counting, unlocking and locking the phone, imagine it's got to be longer. The time's much longer than that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because to our point here, we're going to get, we get distracted or sucked into an email or something. Is that bad? So I am the book. I write a lot about the idea of happiness and technology, not necessarily being an oxymoron, right? <clears throat> but sometimes we think, and we've heard recently that screen time is like digital heroin. It is destroying the fabric of our society. It's ripping apart our families. It's numbing our minds. And some of that is a bit sensationalist. Some of it might have some, some grounding in truth. Um, the idea that I really have tried to dig into in my book is to explore, is this true? And is it completely true or are there parts that we need to look at a little bit more carefully? And the message that I really came away with after my research was that time on the screen is not necessarily bad. What is bad is unintentional, non-thoughtful use of technology. And so I'm on a mission now to help people understand what does it mean to use your technology more thoughtfully and how do you go about that? Wow, man, we're going to get into that. But tell me your, uh, your story. Uh, how did you grow up and wind up where you are? So you work for, it's, it's called Good Think. Tell us about Good Think. Good thing. Sure thing. So Good Think is a positive psychology consulting firm. We travel all over the world, working mostly with Fortune 500 companies, but also nonprofits, hospitals, um, individuals, parenting groups to talk about the importance of bringing the science of happiness to life. We had our background um, before we started our company. My brother, Sean Acor, was in, um, he was a head teaching fellow for a course called The Science of Happiness at Harvard. And the class became so overwhelmingly popular, more than one out of every four Harvard students signed up to take this course. And so after numerous parent phone calls who wanted to know why their kids were taking a course on happiness instead of economics, then all of a sudden the media started to pay attention. Hey, why? our Harvard students so interested in this idea of happiness. And what they didn't know was that was just the beginning. Actually, it has become a societal movement all across the globe where people are starting to think more about this underpinning of what is driving us towards success. And so good thing just happened to be there at the right time and the right place. And we're able to bring the research that we learned in academia into language that all the rest of us can understand, <laughs> right? It's um, it's not just academic papers. This is material that can change the way we live. It changes the way we think about ourselves. And sometimes it just takes a, a tweak in messaging to really understand how do I make this practical in my life? And so we've taken that message to hundreds of companies now from the White House to the NBA, the Federal Reserve, St. Jude's Hospital, farmers in Zimbabwe. I mean, truly a global movement now. And to, the goal is to share this research. Um, my brother, Sean, really started his research in the science of potential. But over the past few years, I became the one to evaluate all of the new technology that we would get requests to say, hey, you know, I'm developing this new app. I want to give some positive psychology content to the app. How do I do so in a meaningful way? So I became the one who researched platforms, tested apps, tried out wearables. And the more that I did so, the more I realized that there was a fascination with this new technological movement and how it can help us. But on the other side, I hear from audiences on almost on a daily basis where there's this pain point about technology and happiness and technology specifically draining happiness because people feel overwhelmed. They are just, they're tired. They don't know what to do with all this information. They have so many gadgets flooding over their nightstands that they don't know what to do with it and how to evaluate what's, what's actually good for them. And so that's what led me to write my book and um, it's my new, my new current passion as I'm ex applying this idea of positive psychology to real life. Yeah, I, I think it almost seems counterintuitive to bundle technology with improving one's happiness uh, or being more positive. But you make a point in the book, 99.9% .9 of human existence has been without high tech, right? Yes. And yeah. more specifically, I would add personal tech, something you're carrying with you and communicating with. So now mm -hmm. it's here and it's early on and we're trying to figure out how to handle it, right? From a biophysical, emotional standpoint. Absolutely. So 
what I see happening is that we are in uncharted territory and we are exploring, we're interested, we're throwing ideas, seeing what sticks against the wall. We're exploring virtual reality and we're trying augmented reality. And we've got these self-driving cars and we've got smartphones. And there's just so many new things that we're all in a sense playing with and exploring what it means for us. The problem is that since it's uncharted territories, none of us know where the boundaries are. And by that, I mean that when the internet came out, um, gosh, it's been about 20 years now, we would all hop on the internet and you just surf, right? You're just exploring. You have no idea. Things are created. You've never had piracy issues or you haven't had security issues or you didn't have spam in your email. And then as those things emerge, then we deal with them. What we see happening now though, is that because um, the movement has gone, the technological revolution has, has gone mainstream and everybody's on it. We're seeing problems emerge faster than we know what to do with them. I call this the idea of the happiness cliff. And the idea is that just like, if you remember Wile E. Coyote from the old Looney Tune days, Wile E. Coyote was forever chasing after the roadrunner. She was smart and she was quick, um, but she knew where the edge of the canyons were. Whereas Wile E. Coyote would chase right after her. And the next thing you know, he looks down, the ground has dropped out from beneath him. His feet are still spinning super fast. And then he splats to the bottom of a canyon. And it's a great Time cartoon. and again, right? It's a great cartoon. Um, but the visual imagery for me is very helpful because what I see happening is that people get on social media, for instance, say you're on Facebook and the first 20 minutes you're checking Facebook, you're actually very productive and you're learning and you're connected and you're having fun. And then the next hour that you're on Facebook, you sort of forgot you were there and you're still scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And the utility for you has gone way down, right? So what we're trying to do is figure out What leads us to the edge of the happiness cliff, that point at which we are having maximum productivity, maximum happiness without going over the edge? And to find that, we have to set up some boundaries for ourselves so that we don't go off the cliff. Now, to be very practical with that, people ask, okay, so how do I find the edge of the happiness cliff for myself, for my kids? Part of what the strategy is, is to begin to recognize your biological cues. So things like, does your neck hurt? Do your eyes feel like they're glazing over? Does your back feel like you're hunched from the way you're sitting at your desk? Do you, do you start to visit the chiropractor more often? Um, do you feel like a general sense of dis- dissatisfaction or unrest because you can't sit still very long? So in the book, you said something about people are going to the chiropractor because of text neck? Text neck. It's a real thing. No, it's- no. It is a real thing, believe it or not. In fact, um, I just went to the chiropractor myself yesterday, um, and he said that he's seen an, a 50% increase in the number of people coming in specifically for teenagers. So these are not just, it's not just repetitive stress injuries for adults and, and uh, people who are getting older. This is for teenagers who spent so much time hunched over their phones that they actually have neck injuries and back problems developing. Um, it's something that's, that's become more and more researched along with text thumb from spending too long texting. That's, is that the equivalent of carpal tunnel? Exactly for the keyboard, but now it's in your thumbs for a mini. You gotta be. Yeah, it's coming. So these are things that maybe the text thumb hasn't affected our generation as much, but the teenagers and certainly from my kids coming up, this is why we need screen time limits. It's why we need to be able to teach our kids, hey, when you recognize these symptoms in your body, it's time to shut it down rapidly or teaching them 30 minutes maybe is a, is a good limit to start with. Yeah, that, and that, I want to get into that because I want to know for myself, you know, how I can avoid that cliff. And you're answering some of it because that was a question I had was how do I, because I, I, in some cases, obviously I need to use it, but a lot of cases I, I just want to use it, but I may not be aware that it may be making me unhappy. But let's but let's back up a second because I want to talk about this correlation. The study seemed to state that there is an inverse relationship between happiness and technology. But yet you're, you know, in, in the book you talk about how you can actually use it to to be happy. So can you talk about that? Okay, sure. So 
this this study was one of the original studies that measured whether or not happiness and technology had a direct or inverse relationship. And to study it, what they did is they took a group of fifth grade girls and they had them surf the internet for five hours. And they measured their happiness before and after. And afterwards, a majority of the girls said, yes, I feel less happy after surfing the internet for five hours. What was interesting was that study took place in 1996. The same professor, Dr. Kraut from Carnegie Mellon, went back and did the same study once the internet was better developed. So that was in 2002, just six years later. He also worked with fifth grade girls, but this time he split the group in two. One half of the group did the original study where they were just surfing the internet with uh, what they called weak ties. These are people that, or interactions where they don't know the person, they're just interacting online. The other half of the group interacted with someone they call strong ties. So these are people they have a relationship with outside of the internet. It might be an aunt or uncle or friend, somebody that they've met in person, and the digital communication is an add-on to that relationship. And what they found was that there's an inverse relationship between happiness and tech for weak ties, and there's actually a positive relationship for those with strong ties, which is such an important distinction on this conversation that technology is not a replacement for real conversation. It's another avenue to add to relationship building, or it can be if it's a meaningful relationship. So part of my mission is to teach people, how do you lose the tech in your life that is not helping you develop strong ties? And how do you create a positive relationship with technology to use it to actually ameliorate or improve your relationships with people that you deeply care about and want a relationship with? So do the positive, I'm assuming then you think the positives can outweigh the negatives. In this regard, the, the, we can be connected to, you actually talk about a story where your husband and, and your father start playing a, an online game of chess or some app or what have you. And it starts out great because now they're connected more than they've ever been. But then he sneaks away to play. Yeah. He's distracted. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of a, is it a Faustian bargain? In this sense, because some of the other things that you write about in your book, I, I thought were very interesting. So <laughs> the, the smartphone has left us humans with such a short attention span that even a goldfish holds a thought for longer. Yes. That just, <laughs> that's it not really good. It really encapsulates it. not good. <laughs> so, and then, you, and then you state that one minute of distraction is more than enough to wipe your short-term memory. So, you know, is that worth the connections we can have? I, I guess my behavior is saying to me it, it, it is, but it just seems it's just not good, right? And then, and then you talk about when people have devices, let's say a cell phone, there was a survey, and I don't remember who produced it, but there's a survey of when people would answer the cell phone. And 54% said it was fine to pick it up while they're out to dinner. I, I got that. I could see that. I see that all over the place. Even though my wife doesn't like that, whatever, and you know, we try to set rules. But 57%, they'd pick it up while going to the bathroom. I could see that too, and actually. Even, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I'll, I'll cop to that. But even worse, 33% thought it was okay to pick it up during sex. So that's... This is an evolutionary problem. <laughs> it's, yes. It's, a now it's, deal. it's affecting the species. It's so, not okay. Um, yeah. So, and then you have a story. It just gets worse in my opinion because where there was a preteen who admitted that sometimes... When her cell phone battery ran out, she still pretended to text on her phone to give the illusion that she was busy connecting with people on social media. So, Amy, is is there now self-imposed peer pressure to use devices? Well, I think it's self-imposed um, ability to hide behind devices, not necessarily to have to use it, but to be able to hide. It's a, it's a really interesting strategy. Um, but all of these examples, I think, point to the idea that um, technology can be used for good and it can be used for bad, right? The chess with friends story you brought up that my, my dad and my husband were interacting would have been great for their relationship had they had a boundary of knowing when was appropriate to use it, but they'd never played that before. And it was a whole new level of excitement that they were just digging in and then lost sight of what their intention was behind using it in the first place. Um, 
Or the example of the the girl who's on their phone and texting while she's her phone's actually dead, right? That's not an intentional use of technology that fosters relationships or or positive ties. That's that's hiding it. It's using tech as an escape and not as a tool. Um, where I think this is different is think about back in the the caveman days, right? The caveman discover, discovered fire. They knew it was dangerous. But at no point did anyone ever suggest, let's get rid of fire. It's so dangerous. This is a bad idea because they knew not only was it important for survival, but it had, you know, for cooking and for heat and more. You know, there's a lot of powerful uses. They just had to learn how to use fire better. We're in the same kind of place now. I mean, yes, technology has its challenges and distractions, but would you ever want to go back to the day where you couldn't see a relative on FaceTime? around the world and not be able to talk to them. I, I totally agree. And I think the default reaction, at least for me, and I think many, and you're, you, you seem to be changing this, is to limit use. Yes. Which, which, I, which I still think is, is a, a tool in the tool set, I, I think. You tell me. But li, I, I think you just talked about it. But limit use. But outside of that, we don't know how to handle. Well, we're learning how to handle this. And yes. I think that's where why you've written the book and what's in the book, right? Because Absolutely. You, you talk about uh, the, the diminishing returns, right? Yes. So it's interesting. I mean, not only is my book an evolving living document, but so is my perspective because we're all learning together, right? Um, and I'm okay with that. And I, I encourage people to continue to grow with this. But um, I noticed I spoke to the American Academy of pa- Pediatrics about a month ago, and I was asking them about their new recommendation for young people around technology. Um, up until recently, their recommendation had been that Uh, Children under two did not need to be on screens and children over two should have no more than two hours on a device. Cut and clear. They've actually recently changed that for children who are two and over that it was two hours of non-educational time or something. I can't remember exactly what the strategy was, but that it was very intentional what kinds of things like two hours on FaceTime with your family didn't count. Two hours at school didn't count. Two hours learning on your computer didn't count. Only it was like games and, and surfing that they were talking about. So the restrictions are continuing to change as we begin to decipher and get a little bit more granular about what these boundaries mean. We started with a blank, you know, a a kind of a chopping block. And now we're saying, okay, you know, there's many different angles here and many different families, different needs for technology. A young person who's blind might be on their phone uh, 10 hours a day using the Be My Eyes app, which enables sightseeing people to be able to help provide guidance to a blind individual who's trying to navigate a new city. Um, of course, that makes sense, right? Uh, very different types of interactions. And we have to really think through not just a blanket statement, but what does this mean for you? And it's how I draw the audience in in the book to say, you know, what what is your third prong? And by that, I mean, if you think about a plug that goes into the wall, there's that third prong that kind of grounds your energy. It focuses, it channels you. And what I want listeners to think about is what is it, what are their guiding principles and beliefs that make up their third prong? How does your family work? How does your life work that you need to interact with technology? And then what intentions can you set down for yourself about how you personally want to use tech? Do you want to use technology to connect with strong ties more? Or do you want to resolve that you're not going to use your phone at the dinner table? Or please, please don't use it during sex. That's a horrible idea. Or, you know, could you could you be using technology specifically to learn more, but cut back on entertainment? So what is it for you? And then to write that down, because we find that individuals who write down their intentions and their goals stick to them 42% more and achieve their goals more. So I think that's a great starting place. So the third prong is intention? It's intention. I, I define it as your grounding principles and beliefs behind your intention. Like, what is it that drives your personal decision making? Uh, whether it's, you know, beliefs about faith or about the world or about how you want to operate. Um, well, some so, people, so, give, so give me an example. What's your third prong? 
What's my third prong? So I have a strong emphasis on family. I've got young children right now. I've got a 10, seven, and four-year-old. So when I use technology all right, at work, I want to be as efficient as possible. And then I want to unplug so that I can maintain my thought and writing creative power. And then when my kids come home, I want to be off technology because I value the face-to-face time with them unless we're doing something very meaningful and building skills together. Um, so that's that's one of the things that drives me. So if you're a parent, are you giving your children the third prong? Because their third prong is going to be games. Right. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the core the value. <laughs> it's, it's a core value. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that is, they need help figuring out some of those things. And sometimes just like the rest of priorities within a family, we help guide those uh, based on what we as a family do. So I am teaching them that the education games are very valuable. In fact, I try not to install games that are not educational on, on my iPad for them. And I make sure that when they are on it, that I'm right there with them so that I'm tracking along with what they're doing and I'm not just using it as a babysitter. Uh, so that's one of my third prongs. I don't want to use tech as a babysitter. Um, but people at different stages of life might have very different things guiding their use of tech. Let's talk about games. What's your research say on the impact of, let's say, video games? Like I see, you know, my, my stepson, he's con- connecting with people. He's engaging with his friends online, but he's probably meeting a bunch of other people around the world. Yeah, you're going to hear me beating uh, the similar drum, which is, you know, how he's using it and for how long is going to very personally depend on him. Um, I think that if he is sacrificing other things in life that he feels like he's missing out on or, or other people see he's missing out on, then it might be uh, impacting him. Maybe, maybe only six hours would be optimal or let's hope for two maybe. Um, because my guess is that when you're in a dark room playing on video games for that long, you are going to start to feel it. You're not getting exercise. Maybe your, your eating habits aren't as good. You aren't able to connect with people in person. So there's definite pros and cons. Just playing games, though, no hard limits. It has to be very individual. People keep asking and wanting a firm answer from me, and I really do think that I want a it firm depends. answer from you, Amy. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it depends. Okay. I've been actually asked if, if I think government should dictate how much time people spend on the internet. And I said, oh, no, <laughs> please no, because this is one of the great American traditions that we're able to have freedom of choice and opinion and lifestyle that I think um, really drives our ability to use tech for many different reasons. How, how do you recommend we use Facebook? I asked that because I, was, I, I interviewed uh, Tasha Urich, uh, who wrote uh, mm-hmm. Insight. A uh, book yes. about self awareness. Asked her whether Facebook could her personal growth, and and she said it, the, the way you use it, and when you post, think whether you are an informer or a me former. Mm-hmm. In other words, a, a me former mm. is someone who posts social media mostly relating to themselves. She said that's probably not good, but if you're an informer, you're sharing and helping other people learn or letting them know about something. You're posting updates. That's mostly information sharing. So that was helpful to me because, you know, I use Facebook. And sometimes when I'm posting, I'm like, ooh, am I, am I hurting myself, one? Number two, I'm thinking, am I hurting someone else? Like if I'm, you know, on the cliffs of some Greek island, it's fun for me, but there may be somebody less fortunate than me who might see that with this impact, right? We're in some weird areas now, right? It's like, wow, it this is fun, but is this making me a narcissist or not? Does that make sense? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think this, I think your, your uh, transparency is helpful because a lot of people struggle with this, right? That there's this idea that you are trying to keep up with the Joneses on Facebook and you are comparing your life against other people's lives. Even if you don't mean to, you see it and it happens. Right. Sometimes it's so cool what I'm, I feel like I'm doing or experiencing. I just want to sh- say, hey, look, at this is awesome. Look at this. But I've been on the opposite end of that. You know, I've been buried with work and I see somebody from Hawaii going, woohoo. And I feel less. Yes. <laughs> or, or I'm resentful. Yes. Of course, that may be so, my personal issues I need to work on. But I think <laughs> I think some of it is how we process information, and you can't control the way that 
somebody else is going to process what you're doing. But my number one strategy for Facebook use is because we're trying to develop those strong ties, authenticity is key. I think the being able to reflect who you are, where you are, and why you are at this point in time is the same way that you'd have a conversation in real life, right? If you talk all about yourself, no one wants to talk to you. But if you're going to share a little bit or give some advice to help other people, you're rounding out the communication and the conversation, that's useful and it's real conversation. Yeah, but people are Um, putting their best foot forward, right? We should have a week of everybody just sharing the worst things that's happened to them that week. That would be like awesome. <laughs> we, sa- we save that for election season. <laughs> um, I think that's that when people get real. That's yeah. when it gets real. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, people know this about Facebook now. It's something that's pretty well developed that we know to take it with a grain of salt. It's something that I worry about more for young people who haven't been around it very often to learn some of those skill sets, like, yes, this is not a hundred percent real life. It's only, only one reflection of things going on. Um, it's okay to share when things are difficult, but there's some there because this kind of conversation is recorded and it's eternal, it's out there in cyberspace and you can't control the information and who hears it. There's some strategy about how we share that needs to be taught. Um, in the same way that we teach children manners in elementary school, I think we have to teach social media manners because this is something that's emerging and coming. Um, probably some adults could use some of that too. I'm, <laughs> is my you guess. know, I, I, I was just thinking, Amy, I don't know what you think of this, but I, I've, I'm glad that I didn't grow up with all these platforms. And the reason why is I, I hear from other parents where their kid is getting bullied on Facebook, Twitter, like horrible stuff. Absolutely. Or text, really, you know, just horrible stuff. People say, you know, in the past, there was not a platform you could hide behind. You were either saying something in person or on the phone or maybe a paper note with your signature or just anonymous. And it's easier to dispense with. But people can now jump on a bandwagon. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to take this in a negative direction. I'm just saying I just reflect that kids really need to have some some resilience these days because yes. they don't know what they're saying and they're they're saying the worst things possible. Yes. yes. So my husband is an adolescent medicine doctor. He goes by Dr. Bobo here in Dallas and he only sees 10 to 26 year olds and his office is filled with bean bags and a guitar and um, just relaxing teenager kind of stuff, uh, coloring for meditation. It's super cool. But one of the things he hears every single day is both kids and parents coming in talking about the cyber bullying, um, talking about screen time limits. And so I get to overhear some of these conversations as he's thinking through how do I advise my patients. Um, and what's been interesting is that he, he, re- he recalled one parent who came in and said, um, you know, my, my son is socially awkward and he wants to get on social media, but I fear he's going to get bullied because he's just that kind of kid right now. And I also know that if I don't let him on social media, he is only going to become that much more socially awkward because I'm cutting him off from a big part of culture right now. And so she was really, she was so anxious about what do I do with this? And the conversation or the advice that my husband gave was to um, allow the young person on social media, but sit with him very carefully and develop that relationship, develop the skill set for how do you interact online, talk about resilience, talk about what you do with information when people aren't being nice. Because if you just let your child out there, they don't know how to handle this. It's it's crazy. Like people are mean. We hear stories all the time of you know young people who feel suicidal because people have been bullying them. Cyberbullying's gone up by eighty eight percent in the last five years alone. Um, so it's something that's a part of our time that we have to equip our kids. And the strategy I really think is most beneficial is some of the positive psychology principles that we talk about from teaching our kids about how to say gratitudes or to journal, use meditation to calm their mind and focus, to do acts of kindness for others. So it's not just about receiving, to exercise, to, you know, round out your skill set with the offline persona so that when you go online, you know how to be authentic. You have this, this, um, 
this confidence that comes from your outside persona that you bring to your online persona. Um, and then you can begin to fuse them together. So to that point, let's talk about how technology can make us happier. Do you think people are unaware that it may be making them unhappy depending on their lack of conscious use of it? Absolutely. This is part of my beginning process of the book is to do that baseline assessment, download that realized app, see where you're at, do a, a health assessment. So real quickly, the realize yeah. app, because I've tried, uh, there was another app and I can't remember the name of it, but it, it was kind of clunky. It, it, yes, it, there's a if, lot if, of clunky ones. And, and, my, and my phone, when it would lock, I, I'm not sure it was still running. It's going to keep go if the app closed. Yeah, so, this one, foolproof, okay. just runs. You don't have to take a screenshot of your activities. There's some really bad ones out there right now. Yeah. Realized is the only one that I've come across that is Yeah, I had to take screenshots. Hands-free. Yeah, I had to take yeah. screenshots. So, and bad, I guess so I abandoned it. So realize, <laughs> yes. uh, so take a baseline of, a we're baseline. just looking at how much you use it. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. But yep. why is and that important? But why is it for you? But, because that's your wake up call. Unless you have that wake up call, some people don't realize why they need to actually invest time in this. So if you know you have an issue, you could probably skip that, but you won't know how much better you've gotten over time. Um, I'm a scientist. I like to have numbers because I like to see trends, like just like you're trying to see improvement in your, your running times or your health or on the scale or whatever you're doing. This is your way to, to numerically see I'm actually changing my behavior and it's working. Okay. So take a baseline. And some of yep. the other things you were saying for self-awareness is the cues that your body may be giving you. Is that right? Yep, exactly. Like so, if I'm going to the chiropractor because my neck is forward because I'm texting, that's a, <laughs> that's a red flag. <laughs> that's a, if my thumbs are locked up. Okay. What about an emotional barometer? Is there any kind of emotional check? So on my Facebook feed in the next uh, week or two, I'm going to be posting a tech health survey um, that will give people the opportunity to measure and assess both their emotional and physical health to determine where they're at on the spectrum. So that will be coming out. Um, it'll be amyblankson.com slash tech health. And that'll be just a simple way for people to say, okay, where am I at now? Um, again, you can do an emotional baseline as well to see if you're making progress there. There's an app that I've been using. So uh, I've been thinking about creating an app, uh, kind of a happy app just to track happiness. You know, are you happy? Not, you know, measure it. And then what are you doing right now? But I, I found one. I just think it's called happiness. It does ask you what your happiness level is and then what you're doing. And, and it goes into pretty much detail. So that, that may be one way to tra- track a baseline. Right? And I think that those kind of strategies too, you've got to think about what are your goals, right? This comes back to intentions. If you are in a low place in your life and you want to bump up your happiness and you know you need to work on it, then to be able to have that that meter is great. Other people might find that a little bit burdensome to have to report on their mood um, every day. I am moving more and more these days towards becoming what I call a digital minimalist, which is I love technology, but I only want the simplest, most effective, best apps, gadgets, devices in my life. And I want to shave off all the rest. Yes. I don't want any more. <laughs> yes. There are, um, there are hundreds of apps on my phone I don't hundreds. use. Hundreds. And I uh, forgot why. I forgot why I, I, I've got them. So yeah. yeah. I, so let's talk so, about that. What? Tell us what should we minimize? Well, it is personal, but I have some strategies for you. So um, there's a fellow named Tristan Harris who works uh, at Stanford. And he is um, a lecturer who's been creating this movement called Time Well Spent. And it really focuses on using technology for its best and highest purposes and getting rid of all the rest. And so one of his strategies that he talks about is on your smartphone, put the apps that you absolutely most use, the ones you check daily or you find are adding to your life, put them on your home screen, put everything else on a back screen or even in a folder. You can stick all of them in a folder and just search for the one you want when you want it. Um, so if you have a game that you like to play, you can go find it still, but bury it a little bit. So it's not distracting, not tempting, put the stuff you need on, on the home screen so you can focus. Um, likewise, there is a study called the mere present study that says your smartphone and your line of sight, which I'm doing a no, no right now by having it in my line of sight, um, 
is is so distracting because your brain is actually anticipating that somebody might call you, they might text you, and that high of being needed is so tempting that it can distract us without ever touching or looking at our phone, just having it in presence. That was interesting. I read that in your book. That was very interesting. That's why I got yes. a smartwatch. I, w- <laughs> I didn't want to take my phone out of my pocket anymore. Not having it within sight. Am I defeating the purpose by having a watch? I mean, I don't look at the watch. I mean, uh, I don't think I... Now, now I'm reflecting. <laughs> now you're questioning. Yeah. So I'm questioning I- everything <laughs> now, Amy. <laughs> I actually got rid of my Apple Watch um, for that very reason because I I was doing the same thing you were. I was like, okay, I'm not pulling my smartphone out. I'm just going to have it on my wrist. So that means I don't pick up the phone. I just want to know when I get a notification. But it's vibrating and beeping and notifying and it's colorful and I've got all these apps on it. So I've actually, I sort of consider it like a downgrade to a Fitbit because what I really want is I want a clock and I want to know my steps. And it will still send me text notifications, but it's it's so basic in the way that it sends it to me that I'm not checking it all the time. Um, it's just the bare minimum. So this is great. So the recommendation is keep the phone. Keep it out of sight. It gives your brain an ability to focus, particularly on conversation. So if you've ever gone out to coffee with a friend and you had your phone on your table, you resolve you're not going to touch it, but you see the screen lights up. Do you look over at it? Absolutely. Do you start thinking about mm, what message you saw? Yeah, yeah, you, you know. So it pulls you away from what you're doing. You know, let's, let me just say this to everybody that if they don't know that, I will tell me what you think. But I, I get, I get pissed when I'm with somebody and they're checking their phone. And absolutely, I, I, how dare I, they? I, but I don't think. <laughs> well, yeah, but I don't think about it when I do it. Like, yeah. but but when you're on the receiving end, it's and I know they don't. I know it's something. It's their it's their kid or it's something I get it, but it's still, it still irks me a little bit. It's yes. like, seriously, it, it, yeah. you know, that, that kind of. And likewise, when you're on a conference call for work and you can, you can just sense in the people's voices, you can't see them, but you can sense when they're not paying attention to you and they're not a hundred percent there, even though they're spending the time and effort and energy, um, that quality of conversation and the focus is lost and it's frustrating because it's wasting your time, right? So I think those are, that goes back to some of the, the cyber manners that we're, <laughs> we're still in development with. This is great. This is good stuff, Amy. I, and what I liked, there was an attitude that you were suggesting people adopt to say, you know what? We are in control. Not that phone or the computer or what have you. I handle the device. The device is not going to handle me. Yes. So, but the, what, what I realized was my gap was the intention. I never did this because uh, I just thought I was handling it or it, it, you, there's a default mode. Mm-hmm. You just deal with, you, you use it when you're bored or you do this and what have you versus the intention you bring to it. So, okay. Well, th- that's great. So we, we're, I think we're talking about how to increase our happiness, be less distracted, be calmer, what have you, be more focused and present in life. Now, what are some of the things that technology can can offer us from a standpoint of being more happy, in, increase the joy and the connection? And, and I'm talking specifically maybe apps and the actual tech, the actual technology itself. Absolutely. So I say this as well, that um, there are a number of, particularly, let me talk about wearables, because I think wearables offer some real insight into our bodies and minds that we've never had before. It's the technological revolution colliding with the cognitive revolution to let us peel back the layers of our mind and to develop this sense of understanding that we've never had before in history. So I think there's some real value there. Um, but that wearables and apps you choose have to be specific to you. I picked up a wearable called the Spire Stone to try out. And it was something I was really interested in because I'm a naturally anxious person. And I find that sometimes I forget to breathe when I'm really focused and busy. And that makes me even more tense and less focused. And so the Spire app is this small lava shaped rock that clips onto your waistband or your bra strap. And it just measures your breathing and gives you insight that's fed to your phone. It says, you know, you're feeling calm or focused or stressed or tense. And by giving you that insight, it helps you to remember to breathe more. So the first couple of days I was testing that out, it was, it was informational, it was helpful, but it wasn't life-changing. 
Um, five days into testing it, though, I had this moment that actually made it that information transformational for me. My daughter last summer, uh, she was eight at the time, she was swimming in the pool with her sisters and she managed to break her neck. And I had the, and she's fine now. She's back to doing back handsprings all over the house and she's good. But um, last summer was a really dramatic moment for the family because I had to be the one to take her to the hospital, get her fitted for a neck brace that she had to wear all summer. Um, and I happened to be wearing the spire stone at that time. And the whole way to the hospital, the spire stone said I was calm. And I think it was possibly because I was just in that mother go mode where you just, you do something because you know you have to do it. And it wasn't until we were walking out of the hospital that the spire stone started to vibrate. And I looked at my phone and said, you're feeling tense. I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I am feeling tense. I know I am. Um, but what happened in that brief moment of awareness was I realized I was not tense about my daughter's breaking her neck because we'd already dealt with that and we got the neck brace. What I was really tense about was what other parents in the hospital were going to think about me as the mother of a daughter with a broken neck. Um, is she abusive? Is she not taking good care of her kids? You know, how is that going to operate? It was talk about self awareness. Yeah, it was good self awareness, but. It was, it was painful self-awareness, but what it enabled me to do was to mindfully pivot in about 30 seconds to raise my awareness, change my behavior, refocus my intentions, and help me to be more of the mom that I wanted to be. And had I not had the Spire Stone, it might have taken me a week up to a month to realize I was feeling those emotions, but it helped me to get in tune rapidly. And for me, that is technology at its finest, where you are using it to raise your awareness and change your behavior for the positive. Um, for some people, maybe a posture trainer is the thing that helps you, or maybe a Fitbit, or it could be something that is helping you monitor your epilepsy. But I think for each individual, you have to really think about, is this wearable something that's really adding to my life? If not, let's pass it along to somebody else who could really benefit from it or sell it, move on, because you don't need a whole nightstand of wearables. We don't want to have to suit up in armor every morning to monitor our lives. What we need is just that, that brief insight that changes our lives, that makes a difference. And maybe it's not something you wear for the rest of your life. Maybe it's a training device that you wear for 21 days to develop a new habit, and then you move on. Um, but that's how I see a relationship of partnering with technology to change behavior for the good. What are your top five apps? Mm, so I regularly use my fitness pal because I can track a number of different devices that it will coordinate my eating with my sleep, with my health. I also like Fitbit, but you have to have a Fitbit to use that one, but that one does a great job, um, as does Withings. So those are all fitness related. Um, I really like Muse, which is uh, an app that goes with the headband wearable to teach you about meditation. Um, Muse, okay. Muse, the Muse headband. And what I like about it is it teaches you um, meditation, but it's using the headband has an EEG strip that helps you actually see your brain patterns while you're meditating to know, am I actually getting better at meditating? Um, because sometimes when we just meditate and your, your mind wanders, you have no idea if you're doing anything. Does it work? It works really well. It's a great training device, maybe for those who are early in meditation and trying to develop a practice. It's been very helpful. Have you ever heard of Headspace? It's a meditation. It's a meditation app. A year or so ago, I was trying to get back into meditation. It was really helpful. I did. Yeah. They had a, a 10 day program and then I would use it on and off. So it, it kind of helped me to get back into it. I used to meditate and then stopped and it's very easy to, and it was really hard to get back into it. That really helped. Yeah. I, I do use um, Rosetta Stone. I've been trying to learn Spanish. So oh, things okay. like that actually develop and help me to, to grow. I like um, Happify is a free app that actually helps you develop your happiness levels by doing bright, colorful games. But there are science backed with positive psychology tidbits that you get throughout and some assessments that will help you track your, um, your growth in terms of mindset over time. So I really like Happify. Do you know one technology that has really helped me is the podcast? 
app. Specifically, now I can select podcasts based on a variety of things. It's made my any kind of commute I have a traveling school. It's a learning experience. It's technology that has really benefited me. Obviously, I'm I'm just uh, Bluetoothing it with my car, and I will select uh, some interview or some discussion or what have you. And I'm able to surround myself with these people that I would never probably meet or rarely ever meet, authors and academics or teachers, uh, people who've accomplished some pretty amazing things. And now they're in, in kind of my circle of influence in, 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 in that I can listen to them. And, and to me, it's been a very a positive experience, depending, or, or interesting, right? But that's technology. That's an example of the technology that can m- make you happier, or improve your life or what have you. We're talking on Skype, right? Um, yep, we're looking at absolutely. each other and th- th- this is only possible through uh, th- that technology. And I'll add an extra benefit for the podcast as well with listening in your car, not only reduces your impulse to text and drive, it lowers your stress during a commute when you might actually have a bit of road rage or um, anxious about getting to the office. It actually will calm you down and uh, lower your stress. And like you said, it's building happiness because the very definition of happiness, according to the ancient Greeks, was the joy you feel striving after your potential. And when you're listening to podcasts, you're learning about ways you can change your life, learn about the world, um, which all drives to greater happiness. So that is a really smart strategy to use while you're driving. Your analogy was, uh, I think, spot on. Uh, it, it's kind of like fire, discovering fire. This mm-hmm. it can do so much good, but you have to be careful. It'll burn you. It'll it can burn your house down. You know, it's it's uh, you, you really have to take control of it, learn how to use it, and if you do so, it's it can be very very powerful. You mentioned a tracking app that collected all this data. Are there any other tracking apps that you recommend, or you determine a baseline, or improve their life? So there are a few out there that are tracking apps. Um, there's one called LifeSum that I think does a pretty good job of tracking without a whole lot of effort on your part about not only where you spend your time um, with shopping, driving at home, your kid's school. It'll, it'll learn your life patterns and you can see how much time you spend where. The one thing that I want more out of it, and the reason why I haven't stuck with it, is I want that information to provide transformation. Right now, it's just information, and I don't know what to do with it. Unless you're a statistician who's really studying the numbers, or you have that much time in your life to invest in saying, oh, I'm shopping too much, I need to do X, Y, and Z. Um, I think that is the missing link that's coming with technology. But until we have it, it's just a little bit of noise in my background that I'm just going to deal with that. that. That's what I want from this happiness app and why I would thought about developing one is that I want something predictive in the sense that as it collects information that I'm giving it, it can then make recommendations. Yes. Larry, you love tennis. How about these these two other sports and things like that to say, Larry, you like this, try that. I, I want it to instead of narrowing my world to the few things that I know that I'm enjoying to help me expand it and discover yes. new things. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. And, you know, there's going to be, I've actually, I got to see uh, the World Fair in Milan. I got to see a futuristic kitchen and it's a, a fingerprint biometric controlled refrigerator that when you put your fingerprint on the door to open it, it is studying how much you've been exercising, what you've been eating, your water, your water consumption, and then it'll recommend food for you based on that information. I think it risks the chance of people taking a sledgehammer to the refrigerator because <laughs> it might just anger them. <laughs> so there's this there's this delicate balance between, you know, do we really want the information it's recommending or is this something that is going to really drive us bazonkers. But um, I think in the meantime, it's it's fascinating and it's certainly where we're going uh, as we collect more information. What do you think of now the voice devices? Do you have an Echo or Home, Google Home? I don't yet. I've It's purposeful at this point. I have been debating it because the temptation is very high. I want to just explore. Um, part of why I haven't is because no voice recognition program has yet been able to accurately get my voice. So I hate repeating myself over and over. Um, I don't know if my voice is too high or, or what, but, um, 
so there's that, but there's also the element where I know that those devices are listening constantly. And there's one little paranoid part of myself that's like, I don't know who's listening on the other end uh, and collecting this data and where it's going. So I want to understand better. It's one way, now that I'm, I have Google Home um, and I was like a alpha tester back in the Google days, but um, it does limit, it, it, it can help you mitigate if you're, in, to your point, in, intentional about it, where you can ask it questions without being distracted by something that's on a screen. Mm-hmm. Does that oh, make that's sense? A good point. So yeah. there's a, there's a lot of things I do on the phone just that are information. What's the weather? A lot of that can be handled via voice, where you're not having to pull out a device, and it, it can be used in with with that intention. So that may be one way to manage technology by how it's used. Let's say voice over looking, but I don't. You know, just throwing that out there. Well, it's an interesting point you bring up because uh, about two months ago, I spoke with one of the founders of the Samsung Galaxy phone, and he predicted that within the next three years, phones won't exist anymore. That blew my mind. (laughs) Have you seen the movie Her? I have, yes. To me, that is a very viable future not only from a technology standpoint, because the technology, uh, a lot of it exists now, but from a standpoint of a, a mixed use of uh, voice and device. So you know, in that movie, you saw that he had that earpiece mm-hmm. and uh, and maybe Apple's moving that way with, with the, uh, the their new earpods, but he didn't put, pick up the phone until the uh, operating system said, and here's, here's that picture or here's that. Mm-hmm. So... It was very interesting. Uh, yeah. You, you know, uh, now you instead of people looking down at a device, they're all probably just, you know, in, in the movie, maybe distracted by something in the ear. But anyway, it, it, it was just an interesting take, uh, I thought, in the future. And it was uh, from a standpoint of what a future could look like. That, that to me, was very uh, – th- that rang true. Point, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, I got it. And so this has been great. I want to ask you my, my Timescape question. All right, so Timescape is a movie. It's also called Disaster in Time. Have you seen it? No, I have not. Okay, I don't, many people haven't. Long story short, he goes back in time and he's in jail. And to get out, he calls himself his self that's in the, the present day. So, ah. so he's able... This is very Back to the Future. Yeah, this is very Back to the Future. He's able to be right in the same spot where without the universe ripping in two. But anyway, so it led me to this question. If you could just make a call to yourself in the past now mm. to give yourself some personal advice. Number one, when would it be? And number two, what would you say? Specifically technology related? No, well, it could be it could be anything as long as it's not, hey, buy, you know, Apple stock or uh, you know, there's an earthquake coming, go, you know, go buy real estate. Yeah. My answer is not tech related. It would simply be, um, back in 2005 was, um, when my husband and I were living in Biloxi, Mississippi, and we had been stationed there by the air force and the, um, we'd been there for all three months and really had fallen in love with the community. And then uh, hurricane Katrina hit. And in a span of three days, we lost our house and we lost our community. We lost our dog. Um, it was it was a hard time for us. Um, w- I was in the middle of business school. So I was living in one state after that. And my husband was shipped to another state. Um, just a lot of chaos. But I think what I wish I had known back then was the research of positive psychology that said that our external circumstances don't define our happiness levels. Um, in fact, only about 10% of our happiness is determined by our external environment, meaning that the other 90% is up to us. It's our perception of the world, our genes, our decisions we make, our outlook on the world. Um, and what I wish I had known was this information that I actually can control my fate. I can control the future. I can control how I process information because the human brain is a single processor. We've got 11 million bits of information that fly towards us every single second. 
but our brain is actually only picking up 40 bits of information. So if I only pick out the negative ones, the defeated ones, the ones that are distracting, the ones that are frustrating, I'm missing out on millions of other bits of information that could be useful to moving me forward. And knowing that information now, I think I would have processed the situation differently during Hurricane Katrina. I would have said, you know, this this situation isn't permanent and pervasive. This is something that it sucks, but that can be a an opportunity for post-traumatic growth and to help other people. And it's something that I make a choice about how I shape my future in response to that. Um, Literally about six months after that is when we started Good Think. And my world changed dramatically after we began this company in ways I could have never have foreseen. Um, And we wound up moving to some places and meeting friends we loved. So I think that I point that out because I think in the context of this conversation on the future of happiness, it's relevant for all of us to think about, you know, what do we control about our worlds now? What 90% are we hanging on to? And what maybe should we do to scan our world for some other information that's helpful to change our lives for the better? Wow, that's great. (laughs) That. I think that would have helped your past self tremendously. You just encouraged the heck out of me. So that is great. Amy, this has been fantastic. You are wonderful. Thank you, Larry. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for coming on. Tell us where to find you. AmyBlankson.com is probably easier. So it's B-L-A-N-K-S-O-N, AmyBlankson.com. And that's got all the information about the book and the resources that we talked about today and some of the apps that I mentioned. And if you even go to amyblinkson.com slash stage, there is a download of about a hundred different apps that can help give you guidance if you're looking for raising your gratitude level or your savoring or your empathy. Um, Just some ideas that will get you started. Um, Maybe you can pick out one you want to try in your own life for the next 21 days. So I encourage people to check that out as well. amyblinkson.com forward slash stage. Stage. Yep. S-T-A-G-E. Amy, thank you so much. It was, it was great talking with you. Well, that is all the time we have today.